Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome. We're going to do a quick video talking about some of the key differences between arrays and linked lists. So these are two very common data structures, ways of storing numerous pieces of data. And if you are a developer or a computer science student, you probably are going to run into this. So you need to understand which you want to use and when. Also, you probably want to know what some of the most common programming languages use to store data. So that's what we're going to be getting into in this video. You guys have been begging me to do some data structure videos and here you go. The first of hopefully many. And if you want some more shameless plug, I got a link in the description for you guys for a program you can get, but that's enough advertising here. We're going to get right into it. So the very first thing is why you would want to use either an array or a linked list. And the main reason is to store multiple pieces of data. If you just had to store one piece of data, you could just use an integer or a string. But when you have to store 10 pieces of data or 100 pieces of data, it could get very unorganized if you have 100 different variables. No one wants to do that. So you can basically group a bunch of data together. Consider these like buckets that you can put things in. A common term you might hear is a collection, a collection of data. An array is an example of a collection and so is a linked list. Array, I would actually say there's two main types of arrays. There is a static array and there is a dynamic array. So we actually have three things we're going to be talking about. Static arrays, dynamic arrays, and linked lists. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll know which one to use. So let's talk about the first one here. Static array. The thing about a static array is that in memory, in your computer's RAM, all of the stuff is stored sequentially together. So, I mean, I'm not gonna draw a beautiful picture, but we'll, we'll try my best here. All right, so let's say this is your computer RAM and you can store an integer here or you can store a string, whatever you need to do, but you actually wanna store multiple pieces of information. So you block off some section of your RAM. And in here, you split it up into different spots where you can store data. So you can put numerous numbers in here. and it's all sequential inside of memory. When you're dealing with a static array, the keyword static here means that it doesn't change. Once you determine that size, it's going to forever be that size. A common issue that people have is they will add data at the end of it beyond the max, or they'll try to access data that's not actually there, and that'll throw an exception, or make your computer explode, or make you lose your job, or all of the above. So if you want to be like a failure, do that. But if you want to be a good developer, don't do that. So you always have to keep track of that list. So if you're working with a programming language like C, first off, I'm sorry, I feel bad for you, but you're probably gonna have to keep track of the length of your list. So you often have another variable you're passing around to functions, which is basically your array length. That way you don't go outside of the bounds. Fortunately, with some of the other programming languages, you're going to have some function to calculate the length and it basically maintains that knowledge with it, which makes our lives a whole lot easier. But with a static array, you have to keep track of that yourself and you're limited to that size. So if you think you're only going to need five spots and then you later find out you need 10, you're doomed. So this is where a dynamic array comes in. Now a dynamic array, you can use it just like a normal array. It works the same way in memory. The difference here is that if you say, hey, I want to add an element and you go outside of the bounds of that array, it's going to catch you and it might just be behind the scenes. You won't even know, but it will actually create a new array. So it's going to create a new array for you in memory and it'll probably like double the size. So we have what, one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven, eight. You probably end up having 10 spots. So in this situation, you have pretty much a, a physical length, how much room it takes up in memory. And then you also have a logical length, which is how many elements you have in it. So behind the scenes, this will actually be copied over to this larger array. So you'll have 10, 
25, 30, 5, 6, and let's say you added the element 8. Doesn't really matter. So the logical length here is going to be 6. There's 6 elements. The physical length here is going to be 10. Whenever this logical length is increased beyond the physical length, the physical length will increase, likely doubling. So if you go above 10, it'll likely double to 20. So that is how a dynamic array works. And from the developer's perspective, the, the user of this dynamic array, we do not have to worry a whole lot about this process. It just works. So you probably have some variable and we'll just call it, I don't know, something like grades. And there'll be a method such as add or append and you can pass some data in here and you can just keep doing this. If the logical surpasses the physical, it'll automatically increase the memory size so you don't ever have to worry about it. So that is the beauty of a dynamic array and whenever you can use a dynamic array over a static array, do it unless you're 100% positive you're never going to need more than a certain number of elements, then you don't have to worry about it. So if, if you know ahead of time, meaning when you're coding the application, how many spots you're going to need, you can use a static array. Static meaning you know it up front. If it can change, such as reading from a database or reading from a file or asking the user for input, well, you don't know how many values are gonna be there. So in that situation, you will want to use a dynamic array you can probably build something like this in C, but there's not a real easy way to do it by default. In C++, they introduced the vector. That makes everybody's lives a whole lot better. Inside of Java, you got the array list, same with C Sharp. In Python, you have a list. So a list behind the scenes is a dynamic array. And that pretty much sums up most of what you're going to be using inside of modern programming languages. Now, the other one that we wanna talk about is a linked list, and this works a little bit differently. The actual interface for working with the linked list might be the same. You know, you still might be able to say dot add or dot append. You still might be able to get things by index. So you might be able to say, hey, grab the thing with the index zero and grab that element. But structurally and the performance is different. So it's structurally different and it performs differently. So let's talk about what a linked list might look like. And before we do that, there's one more thing I wanted to show. And that is in this situation, we are storing the elements directly inside of these spots in memory. You could also have a situation where instead of storing them directly, you're actually storing pointers. So in that situation, it's no longer gonna look like this it'll look like this. So let me actually, here's a pointer to the value 10, here's a pointer to the value 25. And in this situation, the array itself is sequential in memory, but the data it points to can be anywhere in memory. So for example, this one can be somewhere totally different, but you can still read through the data just the same way. The only difference is with this, you have just an additional pointer for each element. No big deal. So that's all I got for arrays. And now let's talk about linked lists. And of course, I forgot my eraser. No problem, guys. I got a towel here. So with a linked list, you're going to basically have a node, a thing to store the data. And when you do this, this node is going to have two pieces. So we'll split this. The first piece is going to be what you're trying to store. So let's say we're trying to store the number five. The next piece is a pointer. And this will point somewhere in another spot in memory. So here's the magic here. It doesn't have to be sequential. It can point, point anywhere in memory. And it's going to point to another node. Inside of this node, you're gonna have another piece of data. We'll say 10. And then we got another pointer, which can point somewhere else in memory. And we just keep repeating this process. Let's say we have the value 15, and we point somewhere else. I'm drawing it in this weird design, just to show you guys 
that the location doesn't matter inside of memory. However, for sanity's sake, people often think of a linked list as a straight line. <laughs> so we could draw this data out to, to show how it's represented like so. We have 10, that points to some other value, 15, that points to some other value, three, doesn't really matter. So you have these nodes and they'll all be connected. And oftentimes you'll have some larger structure to contain it all. So you could say, this is your linked list. Now linked lists are not as popular as dynamic arrays because they have some serious downsides in terms of performance. The obvious benefit is that it doesn't have to be sequential in memory, so it can point anywhere. And if you're always going to be going one element after the other, then a linked list is perfectly fine because you can go from this element to this element to this element and keep going down the chain. However, grabbing any element by an index is not so easy. When you're with an array, you know that starting position. So if you wanted to grab this element here, all you gotta do is figure out the size of the individual boxes, multiply it by the index you're trying to grab, and you'll get the element or something like that. With, an, with a linked list, it works a little bit different because these can point anywhere, anywhere in memory. We cannot easily just grab it and be done. So we actually have to start at the beginning. So if we're trying to get the third element here, we start at the beginning, go to the next position, and then go to the next position. And then we grab that element. Obvious downside here is that if you have a really, really large linked list, you're gonna have to start at the beginning every single time you want to get a particular element. When you are working with a linked list, you can do the same kinds of operations. You can add elements in the middle, you can delete elements, just the way you do it is a little bit different. So as an example, if you wanted to add an element right here, all you would do is change this pointer to point to a new box, let's say the value seven, and then this box would point to this one here. So that is how a linked list would work. Same thing if you wanted to delete a node. Let's say you want to delete this 15. All you got to do is grab the, the node before it and make it skip it to go to the next node. It doesn't even matter if this one's still in memory. It's irrelevant because we don't have a pointer to it. So in our mind, it's essentially not there and garbage collection will get rid of it. So that is how a linked list works. So which one do you use? More than likely, most of the time, you're going to want to use a dynamic array. You will occasionally run into linked lists if you're in a data structures class, or if you are doing something such as hash maps. Oftentimes, if there's a collision, they'll use a linked list. So let me show you what that might look like. So let's say we have a table here, and we want to insert data into this in a hash table-like manner. We might have some data such as 16, Caleb, where there's a key and a value. Well, this key is going to get hashed, and I have videos on that process if you want, but basically it goes through some function to determine what the index is going to be. And let's say it goes through that function and the final value is five. So it's gonna go at index five. And that's where Caleb goes. Well, let's say we do another one, and this one we have an association of like an ID of 112, and this is Sarah. And this 112 goes to this hashing function, and by chance, it gives us the same value. So it also goes to index five. Well, a common use of linked lists is to also put that value here, but just attached through a linked list. So then if you wanna retrieve data from this hash map or hash table, you would say, hey, get me the, the value with the key 16. It'll go there, find Caleb, and be done. And if instead you said, get me the value at 112, it'll go there, realize it's not that, but it's a linked list, so it'll go to the next element, and boom, it's done, it got that element. 
So that is one use of a linked list, but I'm sure there's a quadrillion, bajillion other ones out there. So that is my introduction to arrays, dynamic arrays, and linked lists. Obviously, there's a lot more we could talk about. And if you want to get the code to implement something like a linked list and get a little bit more experience with hashing, then check out Code Breakthrough, link in the description. We're basically trying to implement all these different data structures in Python and talk about the entire process from beginning to end. So if you appreciate this content, but you want a little bit more hands-on, then I think that would be ideal for you. So thank you guys. Let me know if there's any questions in the comments below or any areas of confusion. Maybe it's something I could do a video on or even a series if it's something really in depth. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to subscribe.